Hello everyone and welcome to the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host of this instructional cooking show. Today we have a very well-known chef. His name is Steve LeCount. He is chef owner of Chiara Bistro that's located in Westwood. He will be making this delicious dish. It is a butternut risotto with duck confit, walnuts, and orange soaked dates. We are filming here at Motherbrook Arts and Community Center in Dedham. So let's go over to Joe and Steve to learn how to make this dish. Hi, I'm Joe Murphy, co-host of the Chef's Table series. This show is produced by the Chef's Table Foundation, and the foundation is dedicated to supporting homeless U.S. veterans and underprivileged homeless young teenagers with a GED or high school uh, diploma, and we are working towards paying for culinary school educations if they'd like to become a chef. And today I'm very pleased to have a wonderful chef, and he always winces when I say I think he's one of the best chefs in the country, and I truly do think that. Thank you. <laughs> and he is the chef owner of Chiara Bistro on Route 109 in Westwood, or High Street Westwood, which is the same. But Chef has also had a long career. He was the executive chef at the Country Club in Westwood. I mean, in Brookline, Brookline just yeah. know. Excuse me, and he's little been trained all over the world, right? You've gone, traveled, done a lot of work. Well, not all over the world, but uh, enough Close. places, right? <laughs> and so, he's also yeah. a supporter of the show. And Chef Steve, he does a segment every week called Chef's Tip of the Week. Just crazy little things that you know you don't really how to get the seeds out of a pomegranate and. I've told that to many people, and you might get out of 10, one person that might know that trick, but many little tips. So we're very grateful that he supports us with the show. So, Chef, what it's are like we making? basically say I work for tips. You work for <laughs> tips. That's <laughs> the pay stinks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and it's for a great cause, so thank we're, you. we're happy to be here tonight. Thank so. you very much, Steve. Okay, what are we going to make tonight? Well, when we do dishes here and with, a, with an audience like that, we actually, these sound complicated. It's got this fancy name. It's a butternut risotto with duck confit, walnuts, and orange soaked dates. Mm -hmm. Okay, people get afraid of the word risotto. They get afraid of the word confit. Mm -hmm. what, what I'm trying to do is a dish that can very easily be replicated at home. Okay. And as right. a matter of fact, a lot of the components of this can be done in advance. Right. Uh, so if you're having dinner party and you want to do a simple risotto dish that's not going to have you in the kitchen all night, then this is a perfect uh, okay. dish. It's Would you mind, the show is, is designed to be instructional. Could mm -hmm. you just explain confit to our viewing sure. audience? Actually, and, uh, that's the first step we're going to take. Okay. Uh, be before we get into that, I just want to explain risotto sure. a little bit because people think risotto is the rice. Yeah. Uh, risotto is a dish, um, much like People think Chianti is a grape. Chianti is a region in Italy. Italy. The wine that goes into making Chianti wines is Sangiovese. Oh. Okay, so risotto is not the very rice. Good. Risotto is a, is a rice, a creamy rice dish. Right. Uh, and it, it's very versatile. You can do it with seafood, chicken, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. The rice itself is, um, this is a short grain rice. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see it's wider than if you were looking at like uh, an Uncle Ben's long grain, kind of long grain rice. Right. And um, these short grain rices are used. Uh, you, there are primarily two types of rice that uh, you can use to make risotto, and that's either uh, carnaroli or arborio. Mm -hmm. And they're both pretty much the same type of rice. Uh, this one, particular one tonight, happens to be arborio right. rice. And what's great with these short grain rice, they're, they're, you can see the little plump um, granules. Uh, when those open up from the heat, this is a lot of natural rice starch in there, and that's what makes the dish so creamy, creamy. and velvety. Mm -hmm. um, this is also the type of rice you'd want to use in making arancini, right. um, which yeah. are those little fried 
rice balls, balls that yeah. you can fill with prosciutto and fontina cheese and yeah. all kinds of oh, fun God. stuff. Mm. Um, in that case, you want to overcook your your risotto and, and get more of that starch out to keep those balls compact. Cut, right. Uh, but getting back to Joe's question on the confit, uh, confit is uh, an old French technique. Uh, we're using uh, white Peking, du Peking ducks, um, not Peking. That's a that's a Chinese dish. Uh, these come from New York, the Hudson Valley area. Okay. But it's P E K I N is the species of duck uh, okay. that we're using here. And uh, you can buy duck legs pretty readily. You know, they're readily available now. Um, often they're frozen. That's fine uh, yeah. for confiting. Um, if you don't like duck, um, you can certainly use a piece of pork shoulder or mm -hmm. something like that instead. Okay. Or uh, turkey legs yeah. as a nice substitute as well, right. especially around Thanksgiving time. Uh, but to confit, it's, we're going to slowly cook these in, in duck fat. Mm -hmm. um, and then they take about two and a half hours in a low oven. Mm -hmm. And typically what the French do is, after I'll show you how to set this up, um, after everything's cooked, they leave them in the fat, and the fat forms a seal. So no oxygen gets to the meat, it, it cannot spoil. Oh. They will hold that for up to a month in some cases, which actually intensifies the flavor. Uh, and that's what I meant. You can do these a week ahead of time if you want and have them mm -hmm. ready to go. And I'll show you different stages of this. Yeah. So I'm going to start by um, having the, the raw duck legs in here. I think it says four on your recipes. Okay, and of course we're going to season them with some kosher salt and mm -hmm. freshly ground black pepper. Now, this particular preparation, um, because we're using squash, I want to use some dried spices that complement that. Uh, but in almost every one of my uh, duck confits, there will be some aromatic vegetables like mm -hmm. onions, garlic, sometimes carrots. Mm -hmm. The garlic heads, it's very easy to split them in half like that, lay those in there. And then for this one, I almost always use a bay leaf. Right. I always use some black peppercorns mm -hmm. in, on top of that. Now for this particular preparation, I'm going to use clove. Uh, allspice, which may not be on your recipe. Uh, my, I lost my cinnamon stick. There it is. I'm holding it. A uh, whole cinnamon stick, which I'm just going to try to break in half, but this is a tough one. Okay. Just to spread it out throughout right. there. And then this uh, wonderful flavor I love, um, especially with squash and pumpkin right. and things like that, is star anise. Oh. Uh, so the star anise pretty much is appropriately named. You can see the little star shape on it. Mm -hmm. uh, these are popular in the Middle East, Morocco, those, those kind of areas. Mm -hmm. And that will impart a little bit of an anise flavor or um, similar to what you get, you know, those little anise seeds that are in um, yeah. Italian sausage. But this one has a, a little bit more of a licorice kind of flavor nice. going on. To, yeah. I'm actually going to pass that around. If somebody wants to take that, you can get smell that and you get uh, quite the fragrance from it. Mm. And then, if you don't have duck fat, the, the, the most, I'm going to put some fresh herbs in here that complement the time of year, like sage, sage. is just a wonderful autumn herb. Mm -hmm. uh, fresh thyme, I pretty much, is a standard item that I will put in every confit that I do. Mm. And again, this could be chunks of pork shoulder. Right. Don't, don't spend a lot of money on tender cuts. You want a tougher inexpensive cut for this. Yeah, because you're going to tenderize in the cooking exactly. process. Exactly. It's going to slowly braise. Slowly, yeah. Um, matter of fact, I'm going to put this one in the oven for a minute. Yeah, and let's just talk well, you're, about the slow cooking. If you cook that quickly, it's going to be tough. It'll stay tough, right? Uh, yes. It'll also shrink the meat a lot. Right. Yeah. Um, it, most likely will stay tough. This is something mm -hmm. you want to do at 300 to 350 would be the maximum okay. uh, temperature I would, I would uh, use this when doing this. And mm -hmm. let, it, let it cook slow and you, it's, it's a no-brainer. We're trying to cook these until the meat's pretty much falling off the bone. Right. Um, but it's not a, you're not actually braising, are you? Are, are no, you? braising you would sear. You would first sear the meat okay. hard. Yeah. Get a nice crust on it, and then maybe add some wine or whatever in stock, and, yeah. and braise it like that. It's not too different from that. Um, oh. This one we're just slowly cooking in, in duck fat, and it, it will brown right. uh, on its own. Yeah. Now, where do I get duck fat, you ask? 
from the ducks. <laughs> um, okay, the first time you do this, it's okay to use a vegetable oil or corn oil uh, or grapeseed oil, okay, yeah. something like that. Right. That doesn't have a lot of yeah. flavor. You don't want to waste the money using olive oil. It's going to be too strong a flavor anyway. Right. Save that. Uh, when these duck legs are done and you take them out of the fat, strain that fat, put it in your refrigerator or your freezer in pints or quarts like this and it gets better and better each time you use it. So every right. time you confit it. You can also use the duck fat for other things. You can mm -hmm. confit pork with duck fat. Yeah. Uh, it's great to saute potato wedges in. Mm. It's fa fabulous vegetable. Uh, so I'm basically, I'm just gonna cover this. Um, now my duck fat I had, so it's got this consistency where it's congealed um, mm -hmm. somewhat. So you have to keep that in mind when you're putting that over. You do wanna cover them Mm -hmm. But if it's congealed coming out of your freezer or fridge like that, keep in mind heat expands. Yeah. So you don't want to fill it right up because then you're going to have a, a pretty good oven fire going on if you've right, got right. <laughs> melting duck yeah. fat. You know, when you get into, say, a duck fat or, you know, people worry about their cholesterol, it's not like you use this every night. This, to me, for the home chef would be a special occasion. Uh, yes, and, and also, I mean, you are cooking it, you're, you're actually rendering the fat out of the duck leg as well, right. and the skin. I'm going to show you one right now. Um, this is pretty much a telltale sign of one that's done. You've got to cover this with foil. So, okay, it's that you, easy. You do cover it. For the first hour and a half to hour and 45 minutes, leave the foil on. Okay, okay. we put that in the oven. Yeah. Then I remove the foil, and that's basically to let it color up. Mm -hmm. Now, often what the French will do is take that, they leave the skin on, oh. they'll, they'll dredge this yeah. in milk, seasoned flour, maybe two times. They'll take some of that duck fat, heat it up in a saute pan, and you fry it in the duck wow, fat. Wow, I bet that's It is the best fried chicken you're ever going to eat in your life. Right. Trust me on this one. Yeah. <laughs> it's fabulous stuff. But what I wanted to show you was this little section here. Mm -hmm. When that little tendon starts to pull away from that kind of knuckle, um, mm. which is basically the leg, the drumstick bone. Okay, mm -hmm. and you see that bare bone? That's pretty much a telltale sign right. that it's cooked enough. Okay. Now, that's pretty much done. And you can see how soft that meat is right now. Yeah. I'm actually going to take the skin off and show you. Um, the skin is, when you crisp that back up, it's one of the best parts. Right? Right. It's, a, it's kind of a sin to throw it out, but yeah. <laughs> um, you can see this is just flaking right off. Yeah, and wow. it, it's really that easy. Um, but again, you can do these ahead of time. Leave them in the fat, and then just warm them up again when you want to go do this right. step. And they'll stay f fine. They'll stay fine for weeks. Right. So, yeah. And that's basically what you're getting: is nice little uh, chunks of the the duck leg that are really tender yeah. and just absolutely loaded with duck duck flavor. Wow. And, um, and Chef gave you some great tips here. And one thing I want to say is. You know, it's it's two and a half hours to really confit this. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. About that. Yep. So, <clears throat> as Chef said, if you want to have a dinner party Saturday night, you could do this Sunday. I, the I, Sunday before. Right? I did these yesterday. I brought them like that. I'm going to heat these in pie tins in the oven for tonight's risotto. When we we actually did ten legs last night. Took all the meat apart. And that's what we're going to use to fold into the risotto to feed everyone here tonight. Wow. And I'm not going to waste this one either. Right. We're, going to, we're going to use that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next step, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I think I'm going to make Joe cook a little bit tonight as well. Oh, um, I'm going to get the risotto started. Now you're going to see a real chef. Now, a couple of... Um, I, I had to bring this big braising pan, but mm -hmm. um, your recipes, I think, are for four portions of everything. Right. So you get pretty much a duck leg each and yeah. and just follow those. So I'm going to kind of wing it by feel sure. and eye here. But the important thing is you want a wide-based pan, okay? For making four, I would probably use a saute pan, maybe that size. 10-inch, 12-inch. The, the, reason, the reason for that is... Um, you want you want it to spread out, so because you want to feed the stock in gradually, let it absorb it, and then until it's like at the perfect doneness point. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to start with a little bit of whole butter. 
this is all about the locale, the duck fat, the butter, the heavy cream. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, it, it's an extravagant dish. Uh, it's delicious, and it's okay to have once in a while. Just wash it away with some good wine. So. Right. <laughs> Well, All right, so we're going to put a good amount of butter then, in here. As you're putting that butter in, you're actually going to coat the rice with the butter. Is that correct? I am. I want to seal it f at first. Yeah. And uh, just, may I have that half onion there? Sure. Please. Thank you. Uh, okay, and then we're going to saute an onion, dice this and saute it in the butter. I'm not going to brown this onion. I just want to cook it until it's translucent. It's one noisy cutting board. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and you don't have to worry about how perfectly uniform everything is. It's, it's gonna, honestly, it's gonna get lost in this risotto. Anyway. <laughs> okay, that's a good sign. I do have some heat going on here. Okay. You know, I've talked to a lot of people that say, you know, I don't get my pan very hot. And I always say, get that pan smoking hot because it does a lot of very good things. It helps the caramelization, it helps build your flavor. And you're not. Well, with meat especially. Yeah. I mean, if you're searing meat, you want that almost combustible point uh, right. of heat. Uh, for this, I wouldn't go too, too hot uh, because we're using whole butter. Right. And I also don't really want to color my onions. I'm just going to cook those until they're kind of translucent, and then we'll start putting right. the aborio rice in here. Right. And Chef just actually gave me a good tip as well, which I didn't even think through when I was making a comment about the hot pan. That butter has a very low smoke point. And, you know, as Chef, on one of his tips, was talking about sauteing mushrooms and how people love to saute their mushrooms with butter. When you do that, the butter burns so quickly that you're better off using a grapeseed oil, mm -hmm. a canola oil, and then finishing with the butter. Right, so, put the butter at the very end after it's got a nice yeah. br dark brown color. Right. And you'll still get that nice flavor. You'll get better flavor, actually, yeah. out of it. Uh, thank you. I remember that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm melting I always my, listen uh, when you rice speak, container. Chef. <laughs> Okay, so the, uh, for the butternut, one of the things we want to do, I, I, I like the butternut risotto to have a butternut color, a nice fall orange color. Right. So when you buy a, you can typically buy a piece of butternut squash already peeled in the supermarket, which where I got this one. Yeah. I will cut that right, right about there, and then these pieces here, uh, I just, doesn't matter, just randomly cut them. Yeah. Those I put into boiling salted water. Oh. and cook them until they were soft. Let the water cool down a little bit just for safety's sake and I put it in a high speed blender. And that's basically how I made that puree, which is basically what we're gonna use just to color the dish. Mm -hmm. The other half we're gonna use, we have these, um, and the reason I like to use this half, excuse me, okay, we're starting to brown the onions, which I don't really want to do, so mm -hmm. this is the first batch of rice that's gonna go in. Okay, so I, I am gonna, pretty much put a coating just on the bottom of this. And like Joe said, I, I am going to move this around. It's okay to stir risotto. Yeah, and you mm -hmm. get all these chefs that are on television saying, oh, you can only stir it six times in the course yeah. of a risotto. Right. Just be gentle with it. Don't smash it around like it's one of the kids. Or <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a little bit of salt and pepper on this as well. Uh, because I actually want the salt to cook into the into the rice and season that rice. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I'd like to mention is, you notice he put salt in there, and I didn't talk to Chef about this. In a professional kitchen, you will not find salted butter. So no, that's no. unsalted butter. Baking, unsalted butter. Cooking, unsalted butter. And I always say buy it in the block farm, and I'll tell you why. Block farm, there's less water in the, uh, in the butter. So that you're getting more real butter fat, if you will. But it, it's a more solid product than your stick. Okay, so as Joe did mention, we're, we're kind of sealing 
the rice a little bit, and that's to cook some of the salt and the butter right into the, the raw, pretty much raw granules. Right. Okay, at that point, I really don't want to color this a lot, so I'm going to start feeding this chicken stock. Um, if you want to flavor this, if you're doing duck uh, risotto with duck in it, it, it would be even more flavorful to have a duck stock. stock. Right. If you were using the whole duck and had bones. Right. And the beauty of carnaroli and arborio rice is it really absorbs yeah. pretty much whatever it's being cooked in. So if mm -hmm. you're cooking this with shrimp stock, that rice itself is going to be very, very shrimp flavored. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this takes anywhere, usually about 20 to 25 minutes to do a, um, now I'm only going to, you, you can still see the rice, I'm going to let that absorb the first batch, mm -hmm. and then we'll gradually add a little bit more stock right. as we're going along. In the meantime, let's just heat up the saute pan. Um, there it goes, okay. okay. So the other half of our squash, all I did was cut straight down here. If you're, if you're not comfortable with that, put it flatter and go this way with it. But, right, yeah. um, I have some already cut and then I just cut, you know, half inch to three quarter inch width rows. Yeah. Okay, line those yeah. all up and then just make your, make your cubes yeah. nice uniform shape. Right. Now, Chef uh, did a Chef's Tip segment on using basically knife skills. When you get a really solid product like a squash, a carrot, a parsnip, you always look for a flat end before you start slicing because when you are trying to slice through, you don't want that to roll, you're going to slip and cut your fingers. So if you don't have a flat spot, cut a flat spot on it. Even if you're afraid to use the knife to cut it, get a peeler and then just peel a few pieces off, it, it, that would work just as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just cut your own flat spot on a, on a right. round vegetable. Right. It's that easy. Okay, so we're going to... Now, I, I believe your recipes say to blanch these in, in salted boiling water. I'm going to show you kind of a reverse method as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that is definitely one, if you want to do that ahead of time and cool that in the fridge, that's a good way to get them three quarters done and then you pretty much just have to color them with the right. sugar and the vinegar. Mm -hmm. um, but we're gonna go, we're gonna go right from a saute stage here and we'll add the liquid later. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna need brown sugar, vinegar, uh, white vinegar. We really don't want, it's not a dessert. I don't want the squash to be so candied from the brown sugar, oh. but we want the sugar to caramelize it and give right. it a beautiful color. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna add vinegar, cider vinegar, of course, just to balance that out. Yeah, and Chef just gave you a great tip. And, a and second Asian batch going cooking, on that, so. it's a lot about balance. So he's using sugar, and then he's using a pH, the vinegar, and that balances out your flavors, which is a great tip. And now, you, you could see how, how quickly that absorbed all of that stock. Oh, yeah. And you can see the stock is actually getting like a silky kind of consistency. Yeah. And that's pretty much what the finished dish should look like, mm -hmm. except the rice needs to be cooked. It's still pretty right. firm right now. Yeah, so we'll I, I, do, I do have a question, okay, Chef, about uh, with the amount of rice and the amount of stock. What do you uh, use? Four to one is probably for. Um, right. For rice pilaf, for the long grain rice, yeah. two to one is generally a good mm -hmm. ratio. It's always four to one minimally for a risotto. Right. Now, that can be three parts chicken stock, one part heavy cream, which is pretty much what we're going to do tonight. Right. And So uh, it, it's more of a, a liquid. It doesn't, if you're going to use uh, duck stock, and you would normally use three cups, and you want to give it an extra kick with a cream, so that fourth cup would be your cream. Cream, yep. Okay, so, so you don't have yeah. to overdo it with four cups of stock, and then add the cream. It doesn't need the cream either. Right. I mean, if you want to do it all the way with stock, right. that's perfectly right. fine. Yeah. Um, I'm going to lower this a little, so we don't really want this to... We want this to cook gently now. Right. Just keep absorbing the stock. Right. Um, it's starting to soften a little bit. Yeah. 
And that one we want to crank all the way if we can. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I, and I have sorry. a yeah. I have another question on on the types of as Chef was explaining, he really gave you a, a technical explanation. It, it's a boreo rice, and I don't know if it's an age thing. When I'm talking about risotto, half the time I'm saying a three quarter. I'm saying a boreo, and I'm saying, geez, what is the finished dish. So, you know, that's a very good point. So if you're in the supermarket, and to be honest with you, I've really just seen the Aborio version, mm -hmm. you know, maybe in a specialty Italian store. Aborio is more readily available than Carnaroli. Right. Right? They're, they're both very, very similar. Right, right. So, Joe, you can just give those a yeah. couple of tosses. Yeah. All right, wanna... This is one we want this butter to brown. Okay, right. we really want to... Uh, uh, I mean, we're on a little butane burner here. It's going to take a few minutes. Yeah. Um, but to help that, uh, we are going to put some brown sugar in here. Mm. And this will help color up. And it's also going to put a nice shine on the squash. This is going to be one of the garnishes for the final dish. Mm -hmm. Okay, that again is, you can see how much stock this is taking. Um, we're not going to be shy here. We're going to go a little more now. Go a little more aggressively here. Mm -hmm. Keep that back up. Whoops. All right, he's, he's still got it. <laughs> well, you know what's amazing? When he asked me to do that, I said, I don't want to do it because I don't, well, I have announced this on the show, I'm legally blind. And sometimes I won't see some of the things flying, and it's on the floor or on me, but whatever. <laughs> well, you're doing okay. Thanks. Yes. Okay, and one other component we had to this, which I have already um, warmed up a little bit, is yeah. uh, we have some dates, pitted dates here. Which is, you see them all over the place, ripe dates, pitted dates this time of year. Um, you do want to make sure you get the ones that are pitted. Uh, but on their own, they're, they're kind of ugly. They're not, they're not very appealing. This one looks like something Joe might have cooked. You know? Right. right. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to show you what we did with those. Um, we're going to take that date and pretty much just cutting little ring ringlets out of it. And they're re it's really dry and tough yeah. and chewy. Uh, so what we want to do to soften that. We're going to take those ringlets. We I soak them overnight, just cover them with orange juice, fresh orange juice. Mm. Okay, and then today I just cooked them. Yeah, you cook. probably took 10 minutes just to get them nice and soft. And, and this I is going to go right the, into the, the risotto. The aroma some on that stuff. chef was incredible when he was cooking that down. So we call them orange soaked dates. Great. Okay, so we want this to get some color. Yeah. And when it does, we're going to add a little bit of cider vinegar to that to kind of mm. kill some of that sweetness. Balance out that sweetness, right. I should say. Yeah. It was seasoned with salt and pepper. Yeah. I did bring one additional ingredient that's not on the recipe, and these were just some spiced uh, pepitas, which are the insides of the pumpkin seeds oh. uh, that we happen to have on the menu right now at the restaurant. So um, we'll, we'll add those as another crunch element. So we have a, a creamy soft rice. Um, these are kind of soft, but that's going to add an acid element to this because you've got heavy cream, butter. These are things that, you know, on your palate, they're going to kind of coat, coat your tongue and you're going to feel that fattiness. Um, that's the reason why we're using the orange juice. I want to add, introduce one element of acid in here. Also, dates are sweet. I want something that's a little bit sour, like a lemon or, or orange or something like that to kind of balance out this. We don't want this to be a dessert. Mm -hmm. Okay, Joe's getting some nice color on there. Um, yeah, just let me show oh. that. It, it is getting the color. And yeah, yeah. it's really coating greatly. Yeah, you can see sugar. it shining now. That's yeah. that sugar caramelizing uh, right. onto the... And yeah. this should start to go fairly quickly now. Now, again, we have soft and creamy. The dates are soft and tangy. Uh, this, we're not going to cook too much because we want a little bit of contrast now. Always contrast your, your textures as well as your flavors, okay? So like Joe was saying, sweet and sour. It's the same thing when you, on the mouthfeel. When you have something creamy and soft, it's nice to have something right. crispy or crunchy uh, to kind of balance that out. Uh, so when you eat the whole dish, 
in the dish as a whole, it's, it's very pleasing mm -hmm. to all your, your senses. Yeah. Uh, well, that's why you want to leave those a little al dente. He's got beautiful color on that now. Yeah. Watch yourself. You don't want to inhale this. Um, this is a little bit of cider vinegar. Ooh. Okay. And yeah, just don't breathe right over that. It's going to make it cough. I have some walnuts, which are one of the items I'm going to use for crunch. Uh, this is a high heat spatula. If, if you don't, I mean, I do have my old wooden spoon, but right. oh, it's right there. Right yeah. there. I lost it. Right. You okay, so the rice is starting. Chef, would you just explain to him, on, on this high heat spatula, if you're looking for one yourself, look for the reddish handle, because the white handle, you put that spatula in, it's going to melt in your dish. So the red handles are generally identified that it's a uh, high heat. I'm sorry, Chef. Right. No, that, that's a good point. That, they are color-coded like that. The red ones are designed for high heat. Right. Uh, and the white ones, I think, say mother-in-law on them. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay. Uh, and we do want a little bit of color, so we've got some gorgeous uh, flat leaf parsley that we're... We work with a couple of local gardeners at the restaurant. Uh, have a couple of customers that have organic gardens. Um, Five minutes in each direction of the uh, the restaurant, and then we grow quite a few herbs out back as well, uh, mo mostly in pots. But um, mm -hmm. they really provided us all summer long with uh, just gorgeous parsley and chives and leeks and mints and leeks. all kinds of things. Um, right now we're getting some vegetables, the last of their vegetables. The sage came from their gardens as well. Okay, so you can see this is now because the granules of rice have started to open up, um, it's really just sucking up this liquid as, yeah. as fast as it possibly can. Oh, yeah. And we're getting close here. It's, it's still a little raw. Yeah. Um, it's so, nice and creamy. But it's staying creamy. Mm. And I had another bucket of chicken stock somewhere. So I think we can probably kill the heat on this completely. Yeah, I was just going to ask you because um, it's looking pretty. Behind me, thank you. There we are. I knew that wasn't going to be enough. So right. remember, I started with a quart of rice, and uh, it would basically take almost all of this in chicken stock. So I'm going to put a little liquid in there just to stop so that cooking. Right. Okay, we don't want that to brown anymore. Right. So we'll just turn off the heat, yeah. and we'll save that for the final product. Mm -hmm. And maybe the last batch needed. So. Okay, so we have uh, the walnuts have been toasted. Mm -hmm. I toasted them earlier and while they were nice and hot, uh, nuts will exude their own natural oils. That's the time to hit them with salt and pepper because that oil helps make the seasoning stick to the, to the nuts themselves. Mm -hmm. So these were large walnut halves and pieces they're called. Um, I'm basically going to crack some of those up for a final garnish on this as well. Mm -hmm. And we're also, just for color, and because it doesn't really, flavor-wise, it doesn't really hurt, I'm going to slice or chiffonade some of this flat-leaf Italian parsley. Okay, Italian or the curly parsley? Any difference in flavor? Uh, not too much in flavor. Uh, the flat-leaf is a lot easier to work with when you're trying to slice it or julienne it like right. this, chiffonade it. Yeah. Uh, and oh, I do need more stock in there. Okay, so you can see the rice itself is starting to look like oh, twice yeah. the size now. Right. So that's that's a sign, telltale sign that's getting close. And this is probably what the fifth time now I've added stock to this. So, so you don't want to boil it. You don't want to drown right. it with all that stock, but it will just keep sucking it up. So hopefully this will be the last one, and we can go right to the cream step. Mm -hmm. uh, there's only one way to check. We have to eat a little bit. Okay. Um, but people say chopped parsley, and this is kind of a pet peeve, and that's where you will see cooks, and I see professionals that take parsley, and they're cutting it like this, and then they start doing this to it, and really you're just bruising it, and <laughs> it's not meant for that, okay, yeah. so um, parsley usually will enhance other herbs, flavors of other herbs, and it's also really for color as well, mm -hmm. nice color on the finished product. Yeah. Uh, so once you bruise it, it's going to get that dark green and kind of a soggy right. type of texture yeah. to it. 
that just that's went good. off. If okay. you want to turn it back on, and get it on. There. Okay, so we're going to warm up the um, confit duck leg meat here because right. we're getting we're getting pretty close here. Mm -hmm. I think we're okay to. Uh, well, there's only one way to find out. Do you have a tasting spoon or anything? I would have to grow. Okay, grab I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way here. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's a little bit al dente, but I think we're at the point now we can go ahead and add the cream in. Mm. And this looks like a lot of cream because we're making a lot of risotto for yeah. you know, We're trying to feed 20 people here tonight. Right. So. It smells okay. fabulous. You um, know, one thing, uh, Chef, when you were talking about the chopping there of the... I have a pet peeve with people trying to use a chef's knife. It's not a chisel, <laughs> and a lot That's of people good... they'll push down on it. It's a slicing motion. It, it really is the rock. But if you do not keep your knife sharp, you're looking for trouble. Okay, so chef has a special assistant that he just washes his knives. Is that right? <laughs> no, <laughs> That's, I wish. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I do. His name's Joe Murphy. Ah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And he gets to do that because he he's the only one in this room that did not go to Boston Latin School. That's right. I found out my cameraman's part of the Wolf Pack. And yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, fun little fact: I was I was privileged enough to be in the the very first class at Boston Latin School that graduated with women. So. You went to Boston Latin? I did. 1970. Oh, I am so sick and tired of having <laughs> all these Latin. <laughs> that basically means that he's intimidated, surrounded by all these smart people in yeah. the same room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm using the side of my knife just to crack these walnuts. Yeah. No, just because you don't want pieces that big. So. Right. But I, I also don't want the minced. I want a nice little crunch element crunch. in here. So Chef's giving you a great tip here. He's just putting his blade on the horizontal and pushing down. And they should be nice and crispy because mm -hmm. you heated them, correct? That's right. Okay, we're almost there. Yes, it's uh Okay, now's the time I'm gonna add my coloring agents, aka the butternut puree. Mm. Now, when you pureed that, did you add the stock of any kind or just pureed it? I actually cooked the bottom pieces with a little bit of chicken stock and salt, okay. salted yeah. chicken stock. Right. Just boiled them and pureed that. Right. So that's not quite the color I want. Mm -hmm. um, well, it is. It's kind of it's kind of getting there. The mm -hmm. Nice pale orange, or fall orange here, tangerine or. Salmon, coral. <laughs> okay. And at this point, we can go ahead and add some of these orange-soaked dates in here, Ooh. which will also darken the color of this a little bit. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to put all of these in there, but... And that'll be one of those, you know, secret little ingredients you guess will be like... Yeah. Gee, I know what I'm tasting, but I can't pinpoint it. Right. Don't tell them. <laughs> okay, so the dates can actually be done ahead of time, and even if you put, the, you don't, they don't need to be refrigerated. Yeah. Uh, once they absorb the orange juice, you can just leave them out at the counter. Uh, if you want to refrigerate them, you, you can actually microwave those to right. the next day when you're going to put your final dish together. Right. So I just need the heat. Am I up all the way here? Okay. We're getting close now. So. Yeah. Okay, I'm actually just, I want to taste this for seasoning and flavor. Mm, starting to taste like squash. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're just going to wait now. So. Right. <laughs> and, and, and any good jokes? Yeah, well, <laughs> the, the point I was just going to ask you about was I can see there's still a lot of liquid, but this will all be absorbed, correct? It'll be just a few minutes, and that, yeah. that will be absorbed. Right. right, yeah. I could actually add a little bit more of that mm -hmm. to help that, because yeah. butternut squash has a pretty good amount of starch in it, naturally, anyway. So i got to tell you, the, the aromas, of course, my nose is right over the tan, and 
it, it just smells All wonderful. I heard was nose. Was he making fun of my nose? Because <laughs> no. every time Joe asked me to do this, I said, you know I have a nose made for radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, while we're just waiting a moment, can I just ask you about these seeds again? Sure. They are from the inside of a pumpkin seed. You get that larger pumpkin seed, that yeah. middle right. meat that's inside. That's yeah. what those are. And they're called papitas. Papitas. Uh, these were just sauteed with a little bit of butter, mm. uh, black pepper, salt, mm. a touch of cayenne pepper, and a little bit of cumin. Mm. So it just gives them you know, a nice spice. One more thing I think I'm going to add uh, to this is a little, with the parsley, is a little fresh um, chiffonade of uh, fresh sage. sage because it's just, it's just such a nice, pungent mm. fall flavor. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's wine pairing. We are filming at One Bistro located at Four Points by Sheridan in Norwood. Today I have Miguel Escobar. He is the wine director and general manager of One Bistro. I gave him the opportunity to choose a wine with Chiara Bistro's chef Steve LeCount. He made a delicious butternut risotto with duck confit, walnuts, and orange soaked dates. So, Miguel, I see that it's a white wine, and um, what type of wine is it, and where is it from? Sure. Sure, Carol. So, yes, I did choose a white wine for this. So, mm -hmm. what we have here is an Oregon Pinot Gris. Mm -hmm. It's a Ponzi Oregon Pinot Gris. So, What does that mean, Ponzi? Well, Ponzi is a great question. They're, you know, they're one of the most historic families in the Willamette Valley. So, the Willamette Valley is just a little bit outside of Portland, Oregon. Oh, okay. It's really sort of the, the place for Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, uh, in this country. Mm -hmm. Around the 1970s, a couple of people from California started moving up winemakers. First, second generation winemakers are now taking over. Luisa Ponzi is the winemaker. Her yeah. parents went up there in the 70s and they produce this beautiful Pinot Gris we have today, as oh. well as a few Pinot Noirs, single vineyards included. Mm -hmm. So Pinot Gris, kind of a cool climate, grape does well in different parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, beautiful acidity, typically done in stainless steel, typically does not go through malactive fermentation. So you get this beautiful, wow, bright clean. acid, clean, yep. uh, we mentioned the risotto mm -hmm. and the butternut, so that sweetness counteracting with the acidity here, mm -hmm. as well as the duck confit. Again, lots of fat, right. you know, beautiful, and delicious flavor. fat and Correct. flavor, yep. which will really pick up with the acid on here. Oh, uh, so you get pear, you know, some great aromatics on the notes. Uh, just a beautiful wine to go with seafood and lighter dishes oh. as well. Should we try it? Absolutely, right. let's give it a try. So we're twirling to get all the, the aromas and the flavors going. Correct? Right. So when you you know when you're mm -hmm. when you're tasting the wine, you really mm -hmm. want to aerate it, and mm -hmm. then it's perfectly okay to put your nose right. into the wine, and you're really getting the oh. esters, and the it esters are so nice. the smell compounds in mm -hmm. wine. You're really agitating and getting the esters in, mm. and then let's taste it. So you get a lot of that beautiful white mm -hmm. peach, fruit, mm -hmm. and brightness. Again, I think it would be a wonderful pairing with this dish. Oh, definitely. I'll definitely um, compliment the dish. Miguel, good job, my friend. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. So everyone, this has been this week's wine pairing with Miguel Escobar. He is the GM and wine director of Juan Bistro. And we will see you next week. Hi folks, Steve LeCount, chef owner Chiara Bistro in Westwood with this week's chef's tip. Uh, this week, by popular demand, I was asked, how do you mince an onion properly um, and quickly? 
So what we're going to do is take a Spanish onion, medium size, and cut it in half. Take the knob end and just peel the outer peel off of that. Okay, now you want to leave that little knob still in there. Some people cut that out, but uh, we want, for this purpose, we want to leave that in there because that's connecting all these layers here. And I, I do want to take that part off, the top. And basically, I'm going to lie it down flat, and I'm going to put in a series. I'm going to make a row of thin cuts all the way across this. Now, because an onion's rounded, I want to start at an angle here. Okay, and then I'm going to... Notice the angle of the knife. I'm going back to an angle, but I'm keeping that point, which is cutting through that onion. You don't need to do it that quickly, but basically just making all these little rows here. And then I turn it sideways, and I just kind of rock the knife. Notice the motion, rocking it forward quickly. And end result, because I've done that crisscross, you've got a, a finely diced onion, just like that. Thanks for joining. That's this week's Chef's Tip. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Chef's Table Series restaurant interview segment. I am Carol O'Connor, co-host, and I am here with Steve LeCount. He is the executive chef and owner of Tiara Bistro, which is located at 569 High Street in Westwood. Now, not only am I interviewing Steve today, but he's also a resident host of the Chef's Tip of the Week segment on the show. So, Steve, thanks so much for um, having us here at your beautiful oh, restaurant. You're welcome. Welcome. And um, so my big question is, um, how did you get into culinary arts? Hmm. That was by necessity. I, I wanted a 10-speed bike when I was 14 <laughs> years old. My father yeah. told me to go get a job. So I ended up working at a private country club. Oh, uh, wow. As a bus boy, and then I've been in the business. I'm embarrassed to say 40 years now. Wow, <laughs> wow, that's a, that's great though. But um, I really fell in love with the business, and yep. even while I was in college, I left college for a while to, mm -hmm. pursue, to pursue a career in this business, and then eventually went back and got a business degree from uh, Bentley, oh. which which I use every day. Now. Yeah, but, absolutely. But, um, I, I was passionate about this yeah. business, really liked it. So Yeah, you have to be passionate, just in, and you stayed in it for this long. I mean, so many people try different types of jobs and change their careers three to five times, you know, in a lifetime. And a lot of chefs that I spoke to, that's how they started, as a busboy or washing dishes, and they just grew um, passion for it. Now, how did you start Kiara Bistro, and how did you come up with the name? Well, actually, my wife found the location, mm -hmm. and we were at a point in our lives where our daughters had just finished college, and we decided if we were ever going to try to open our own restaurant, now was the time. Yes. Um, before we got too old. <laughs> 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 so that was about nine years ago. Okay, so this restaurant's and, uh, been here We were for in our mid-40s, and uh, <laughs> this site became available, and uh -huh. we just looked at the site. We knew the area really well. Yep. We knew that it was in desperate need of some upscale food mm -hmm. in this neighborhood and the demographics fit the style of restaurant that we wanted to put in as well. So we took a gamble that was nine years ago and we're still here so I guess I wow. guess we're here to stay hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> now describe so. how many seats do you have and describe the decor. It's very calming I find it. Um, we actually had a couple of designers out of Federal Hill and Providence, uh, twin brothers. One was an architect, one was an interior designer. Wow. Uh, out of uh, RISD, Rhode Island School mm -hmm. of Design. And when we met with them, we asked for sophisticated, comfortable. Yes. Told them we weren't doing tablecloths, but we wanted a rich wood. Right. Uh, so if you walked in, you knew it was a sophisticated enough mm -hmm. look to, to understand that this may not be your place if you're the type that likes pubs and Correct. bar food. And Correct. At the same time, we wanted you to feel very comfortable coming in here on a weeknight and not be that formal, stuffy place right. for special occasions mm -hmm. and weekends only. So uh, we thought they nailed it. They, they oh, came absolutely. up with a very warm atmosphere in here. And then our recent addition, we've just added an outdoor patio. Yeah, um, just this past summer. Stamped concrete that kind of fits into the outside of the, the, the exterior, the front mm -hmm. of the building. And uh, that'll seat probably about 20 people or mm -hmm. so. And total in here, we have 98 seats. So. Wow. Um, and you then wouldn't we have a think private so. chef's room in the back that's yeah. got a beautiful wine wall mm -hmm. around it. And it's beautiful. I, yes, I love the open kitchen. 
Oh, thanks. I'm sure a lot of people love me. I would love to sit here. We all love it, but, but it has spot. to be kept impeccably clean. So that's a <laughs> true. <laughs> that's a little bit of a challenge mm -hmm. at times. But, uh, now tell me the types of um, cuisine you have here and type of well, dishes. Well, we, we call it a Mediterranean bistro. Yes. Um, some people think it's falafel and uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. But the reason we call it Mediterranean is because we did not want to be funneled into doing just Italian or, or American or just right, right just Spanish French. or whatever. Mm -hmm. So if we called it a Mediterranean bistro, we could kind of focus mainly on foods, that, anything that touches the Mediterranean. So mm -hmm. you might see Spanish dishes on Greek, yep. uh, Moroccan dishes, mm -hmm. uh, Southern French, Italian. Oh, wow. uh, but in all honesty, we're kind of all over the place. I and mean, we have steak frites on, there's a French onion soup. Mm -hmm. That's not really Mediterranean. Right. But, um, and then we've all, also over nine years, we've adjusted to what the clientele really wants. Mm -hmm. There was a demand out there for a less formal atmosphere on the weeknights, so we added, uh, you know, much less expensive entrees mm -hmm. like a burger and a grilled shrimp salad, and you know, yet you can come in and, you know, on a, a Tuesday, Wednesday night, and and get out of here for, you know, a lot less money than you would maybe spend on the weekend. Correct. And and also in a quicker time frame. So True. We found that that worked really mm -hmm. well. Um, and then we also added a lot of tapas, small plates, and things like oh, that. Oh, people so love that. They some love people sharing. might, rather than opt for an entree, opt for three or four small plates right. and a glass of wine or two. Mm -hmm. so. Or oh, the bottle. Or oh, the bottle. <laughs> so speaking about drinks, you have um, a nice bar in the back. Thank you. Now, yeah. is the um, menu diff like? Do you offer a different bar menu than you would seated? Um, or we've actually today today's bar atmosphere yes. is really about craft cocktails and. Hmm. You know, small micro breweries and th and things like that. So yeah. we've we've jumped on that bandwagon, and I've got to say that's one of the most fun projects I've personally oh, really? had. Oh. Um, I looked at, we added a uh, discerning palate um, menu for all of our liquors, and we mm -hmm. went out and found organic vodkas and scotches and different bourbons. Wow and things like that. And then we always have seasonal cocktails that we combine ingredients and make seasonal cocktails, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which change about four or five times a year. Um, maybe some different sangrias. There might be white peach mm -hmm. right now. It's a, it's a rum and apple cider right. punch, um, things like that. And then the wines, we've really focused on wines that complement the food here. We're not necessarily caught up in these wines that have gigantic marketing budgets and, mm -hmm. you know, really push the name out there on right. everybody. They actually try to look for their next door neighbors that may not be as well known. Oh, and that's interesting. That, in essence, passes on a better value to our customer. Steve, I have to say, yeah. I learned so, like I know you, I've known you for a couple of years, but I've learned so much just from sitting here about, you know, how passionate you are about not only cooking, but also wine, and how the wine and the, the food go together, and also um, about your restaurant. I learned a lot. I'm always learning a oh. lot from you, <laughs> especially, with the, especially with the chef's tips. So thank you oh. so much for being on the restaurant interview You're segment with thank me. Thank you for um, having me here. So everyone, this has been the restaurant interview segment um, of the Chef's Table series. I'm here with Steve LeCount, chef owner of Chiara Bistro in Westwood, and we will see you next week. Right, thanks, Carol. And some of these orange soaked dates in here, mm. which will also darken the color of this a little bit. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to put all of these in there, but... And that'll be one of those, you know, secret little ingredients you guess will be like... Yeah. I know what I'm tasting, but I can't pinpoint it. Right. Don't tell.